Philippians chapter number 2, this morning will be in verses 12 through 16. The Bible says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputing. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not, uh, not run in vain, neither labored in vain. When we think about the Christian life, it's something that we have to work on every day. It's not just something that we wake up one day and it, it just works. No, it's something that we have to work on every day. We think about Christ's work. It was finished at the cross, but we must take up our cross every single day and to follow God. We're not doing this to get saved, but rather we're doing this because we are saved. And it's, it's what we're called to do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for uh, this morning. God, thank you for the beauty of the day. God, just bless our services this morning. God, hide me behind the cross. Help me not to say anything you wouldn't have me to say. God, just put away all the distractions of what went on before church and God was happening after church. God, just help us to focus on you just for a few minutes. Be with our time together and just say your prayer. Amen. Amen. So the first thing I want us to look at is Paul's reminder. Paul's reminder. Paul reminds them to keep doing what they are doing. That's what Paul is telling them here to do in verse number 12. It says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. He's telling them to continue to obey. And he's not saying obey me, he's saying obey God. Whatever God tells you to do is what you should do. That's what Paul is reminding this church at Philippi. When, he, when we keep our eyes on Jesus, it's easier to do what we should be doing. Oftentimes when we get our eyes off of Jesus and start looking at man, we get discouraged. We see, oh, uh, what, oh, that guy did this. He hurt me. He did this. And when we lose sight of what God did for us, it, it, it really it, it takes away from us being able to live the Christian life effectively. Man or mankind is going to fail us. They're going to hurt us. And sometimes they do it without even realizing it. But Jesus Christ will never fail you. He will never hurt you. He will never do wrong by you because Jesus Christ cannot because of who He is. Psalm 118 verse 8 says, It's better to, put, to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. We can put all of our trust, all of our confidence, everything that we have we can put into Jesus Christ because of who He is. Because Jesus says that He'll never leave us nor forsake us. And that's good news. Because uh, we think about even our family can hurt us. Even uh, the people that we think are close friends, they can hurt us. But Jesus Christ cannot hurt us and He will not hurt us. The good news about the Christian life is that we don't have to do it on our own. We don't have to live it in our own power. We have Jesus Christ and we have God who works in us. Verse 13 says, For it is God which worketh in you both the will and to do of His good pleasure. It's God living inside of us that allows us to live the Christian life. It's nothing that we can do. We can never imitate Christ on our own because we, on our own, right? We, we, can, we can't imitate Christ on our own because we, as humans, have a sin nature. But when we, when we live the Christian life and because of the Holy Spirit came and came to live inside of us and to indwell us, we can live the Christian life through the power of the Holy Spirit, not through our own power. Then the Bible says uh, a statement that has confused many uh, people throughout the year, or throughout the years, and confused uh, even many believers. It says uh, to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What does that mean? Paul has used the book. Has used. We think about Romans. We went through Romans, and we talked about how works cannot save you. Whatever you do, no matter what you try, it cannot save you. Only Jesus Christ can save you, and that's through the shed blood of His Son. And so, what does it mean to work out your own salvation? We think about this. As we have been in the book of Romans, and the Son of War for the last several weeks, we know that there is nothing we can do to earn our salvation. We can never do enough work to get us to heaven. Henry Moore says this, Works can no more retain salvation for us than they can achieve it in the first place. But they are the visible evidence of salvation. 
So why is Paul telling this church at Philippi, why is he saying to work out their own salvation? If we were to read it out of context, as most people do, it would make sense to say that I have to fulfill all of these things to get to heaven. But when we read it in the context of the book, we know that in Philippians chapter number 1, in verse number 1, he says, to the saints. So we know that the church, that the people that he's running to are already saved. And so these people are not having to work out their salvation because they're already saved. There is no work to be done. We know that there are stages of Christianity brought about through sanctification. Hebrews chapter number 5 in verses 12 through 14 says, For when, for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principle of the oracles of God, and are become such as need, uh, such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of, of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So there's stages in the Christian life. When you first get saved, you're going to be on the milk of the word, right? But whenever you have a newborn baby, you don't immediately have that baby and start feeding them steak, right? Some of us guys think that we should. We're like, man, they, David, you're ready to eat some steak, aren't you? You're three months old. Sounds good. No, but that's not what happens. They have to have the milk because obviously they don't have teeth. They don't have the ability to chew the steak. But as they progress, they need the meat. By the time they're one or two and they have all their teeth, then they can start eating some of that, that meat and they can start eating some of the stronger things. But you don't want to feed a newborn baby a steak. You want to feed them the milk. The same is true in Christianity. Uh, if, if you first get saved and we, we, we start throwing all the strong meat at you, you're going to choke and you're going to, it's, it's, going, to, it's going to squelch you. But, uh, but when, we, when you start out, the, the reason that you go through discipleship is so that you can get ready for the meat of the Word. It, it's a preparation. It, it is it's how, we, how you go from eating from drinking milk to eating steak. It's really, that's how it works. So, we know that there are stages of Christianity. As Christians, we shouldn't be on milk forever. We shouldn't be on milk forever. Uh, milk is, is something that, and that, that is good for us as babies, but as we grow, we should no longer be on the milk, but we should be on the meat. The point of the Christian life is to get you to the meat. That, that's the point. That, that there's no point in staying in the milk the whole time. Staying on the milk is just going to stunt your growth. You're not going to be able to grow in the Christian life if all you ever do is, eat, is drink the milk. In 1 Corinthians 2, 2 and 3, we see that Paul only fed the church of Corinth milk because they couldn't handle the meat. And the reason that they couldn't handle the meat is because they were carnal. They were, uh, they were worldly. They were they, Love the pleasure of the world rather than the pleasure of God. And so the reason that he had to feed them milk was because they couldn't handle the meat. Paul ends the exchange asking them if they walk as men. The further we get into our Christian walk, the less we should walk as men and the more we should walk as dear children. God did not save us to sit, but rather he saved us to serve. God didn't save us to just come to church and sit around and enjoy salvation which we can do but we have to tell others about what God has done for us as well and that comes through the, the maturing of a Christian so we know what working out our own salvation means it doesn't mean that we're working for our salvation it means we're working because we're saved and because of what God has done for us we are obligated to do work and that work is not going to get you any closer to heaven it's not going to get you any higher in heaven. There's no levels of heaven. We all go to the same heaven. And so there's no levels that it's going to get you higher, but it, we work because we love God and what He did for us. So we think about how do we work out our own salvation. 2 Peter chapter number 1, verses 4-8 through 8 says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. 
For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be bare nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so if we want to be fruitful as Christians, this is what we must do. We, we have to work. We have to, uh, that word virtue can be uh, defined as moral excellence, goodness, or righteousness. So when it says that we add to your faith virtue, so that's, you should be morally good. Amen. As Christians, we should be morally good. They shouldn't look at us and be like, hey, that person says they're a Christian, but are they really? They're not acting like it. Like we should act as we should act like Christians. Yeah. And we think so we add to our faith virtue and to our virtue knowledge. Knowledge is acquaintance or familiarity gained by sight, experience, or report. As we as we are saved and as we continue in the Christian life, we get knowledge from experience. The reason that young people should hang out with the older people is because they have knowledge gained through experience. Amen. And so, uh, the reason, if you only hang out with young people, you're not going to get the same knowledge that you get if you hang out with older people. Because they've been through it. They know what's going on. Just as when you hang out with God in Christ, the more that you know about Christ, and because He has the knowledge of God, because He is God. And so when we add to our faith virtue and to our virtue knowledge, that is it's talking about that we need that acquaintance or familiarity made by sight, experience, or report. And to our knowledge, temperance. Temperance means moderation or self-restraint in action, statement, or it literally means self-control. As Christians, we ought to be able to practice self-control. We shouldn't just fly off the handle every time something doesn't go our way. We shouldn't just lose our mind because something happens that doesn't make sense. Because why would God do that to me? When, when we gain that temperance, we, we gain self-control. We, we know that at the end of the day, God is doing exactly what He needs to do to get us exactly where we need to be. Amen. So when we think about that temperance, we learn to practice self-control as Christians. Then it says to our temperance, patience. This is a hard one for a lot of us. Because patience, uh, I am patient and I'm in a hurry. Amen? Uh, I am patient, but I'm, a, I'm in a hurry. I'm, I'm ready to go. Uh, if you notice, I talk really fast sometimes to my wife. If she was here, she'd be telling me to slow down. Because I, I get to talking. I just go fast. And so patience is quiet, steady perseverance, even tempered care or diligence. So when we add to that temperance, that self-control, that quiet, steady perseverance, even tempered care and diligence, uh, it, we grow closer to God. And so all of these things that Paul or, or that Peter is telling us to do are, are for a reason. He didn't just these words he didn't use just flippantly. He's telling us that we need these things. These are quality of godly people. And then it says to our patience, godliness. Godliness means the quality or practicing or conforming to the laws and wishes of God. Devoutness and up moral uprightness. We should be conforming to the image of God. We we talk about that often. But as Christians, we should be conforming to what God has told us to do. We should be conforming to God's will in our life. It's not about what we want to do anymore. It's about what God wants for us. Then it says, from godliness to brotherly kindness, which is affectionate and loyal practicing, kind behavior. We ought to be kind. Amen. We ought to be kind people. It's one thing. So I think looking back over the years at Christianity, a lot of people are, are pushed back at Christianity because they, people have been mean and they've been mean spirited and they're speaking the truth but they're, they're forgetting the most important part is love. We ought to speak the truth but it ought to be done in love. God loved the world enough to give His Son. We should love the world enough to give our life to tell others about Him. There are no shortcuts to this work. You can't just... Uh, there are no skip grades. There are, there's nothing like that. This is a process that everyone has to go through. Here's a reminder. We cannot work for our salvation, but we must work at it. We can't work for it. Like We can't work and receive salvation, but we can work at it. It's something we should do every single day. We should wake up in the morning and say, God, how can I be more like you today? Then it says... In verse number 12, it says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I believe when Paul was talking about fear and trembling, I believe he was talking about how we should feel if we were to let the Lord down. Think about what God has done for us. 
Think about it. God gave His Son. He died on the cross. And, and I wish that we could all get a picture of what Jesus Christ went through for us. But we, but we can't. But just think about what God did for us. We ought to have some fear and some trembling about letting God down. Because God has done so much for us. He's done way more than we could ever imagine. And so how do we not let God down? Well, I'm going to give you some, some wisdom from Cody. We are all going to let God down at some point. We are. Because, because of our nature. But how do we do it less? God has given us the gospel, and we know to whom much is given, much is required. It says that in Luke chapter number 12, 48. And one day we will give account for our works when we get to heaven. And I don't know about you guys, but I want to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. That's what I want to hear at the end of my life. I want to hear, well done. I want to hear, Tony, you've ran your race well. You didn't, let, you didn't run your race perfectly because none of us can, but I want to hear that I did, I did well, I did good. And the, the way that we do that is by realizing what God has done for us and telling others about it. We shouldn't live a life of fear, but we should be good stewards of what God has entrusted us with. We, we shouldn't live a life of fear because that, that's not healthy for anyone. God doesn't want that for us. God isn't waiting to just stretch us down the first time we do anything wrong. That's not what God does. God loves us way more than that. God, God has allowed us to do some really dumb stuff. And yet He still loves us. And so we, we shouldn't live a life of fear, but we should be good stewards of what God has entrusted with, us with. And we think about, in the Old Testament, Israel carried the mantle. They carried the torch. They, they uh, from, from Genesis all the way through Malachi, they were the ones leading the charge for God. They were the ones who were, they, they were the God's holy people, and they still are. And I, I truly believe that Israel is God's people. And we should all believe that. Amen. Because God doesn't change His mind. God didn't say, oh, never mind, I'm, I'm done with Israel. No, God has sent Israel to the side and He's brought about the church age. And so in the church age, we are the stewards of the gospel. We are, we are in charge of making sure the gospel goes forward. And we ought to be just stewards. We shouldn't, uh, like the steward, we shouldn't dig a hole and put it in there because we're afraid of losing it. Because you can't lose it. We ought to go about and tell others about what God has done for us. How sad would it be at the end of our life when we look back to all, at all the people we shared the gospel with and we had no one to look at? Wouldn't that be sad? To think about, we lived our Christian life for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and not one time did we share the gospel with someone. I can't, I can't imagine. But I, I'm sure it's happened. I'm sure there's people who have never shared the gospel one time. But I want to be a good steward of what God's given to me. William Carey said, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. The reason that we go out on visitation, the reason that we go pass out door hangers is because we're expecting great things from God. We don't do it just to say, oh yeah, we passed out 650 door hangers. That doesn't matter. What matters is that we're expecting God to do great things with our work. We're expecting God to do great things through what we do. And so as a church, we ought to expect great things from God. But not only should we expect it, we should attempt great things for God. We should attempt great things for God. The next thing I want us to see is how we live the Christian life. I do have some good news for you this morning. We don't live the Christian life on our own. That's good news, because if we did, we'd be all be in trouble. But we do live the Christian life through the Holy Spirit and through its power. If it was up to us in our own power, we could never accomplish this, but through Christ we can accomplish everything. The Bible says in verse number 13, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do His good pleasure. Philippians 4.13, this is uh, probably one of the most famous verses in all the world. It says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And a lot of times when we see that verse, it's on a poster of someone playing basketball or baseball or football. And that has absolutely nothing to do with, with that verse. It, it's, it's great and it's very motivational, but that's not what God is saying. God is not saying that you can play baseball really well through my strength. He's not saying you can play football really well. No, He's saying that you can live the Christian life really well through my strength. 
I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It, it is not talking about anything else besides living the Christian life. And we can live the Christian life through Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit plants the desire and the determination to bring pleasure to God. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It, it enables us to live the Christian life. Sanctification involves our cooperation with the Holy Spirit producing a holy life pleasing to God. The Holy Spirit is a guide. He provides the desire and enables uh, to do what's right. And when we choose the right things, He releases the effective working of His power. Think about that. When we do what's right, the Holy Spirit fills us more because we're pushing out the other stuff. We're pushing out the things that get in the way of God moving. And so the more that we yield to the Spirit, the more the Spirit comes and lives inside of us because we allow Him to. We don't get more of the Holy Spirit because we got all of the Holy Spirit we could ever want at, at, at our salvation. But the Holy Spirit has more room whenever we yield to Him. This produces a transformation in how we act and ultimately produces a good testimony to the world. We should have a good testimony with the world. When people think of your name, they shouldn't think, man, that guy was, that guy was a rascal. That guy was bad. That guy didn't care about anything but himself. That's, that's not what we should hear. We should hear, man, there's something different about that guy. That guy, he, he loved Jesus more than anything. He, he loved God more than anything. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21 says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you, that which is well pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom we glory forever and ever. Amen. When God works in us, we work the perfect will of God. And it's not for our own, our own glory. It's not for others to say, man, Cody did a lot for the church. Cody did a lot for, the, uh, for whatever. No, it's, man, God did something. We think about, I think it was Spurgeon who was talking at one time, and uh, this lady came up to him and said, Man, Mr. Spurgeon, that was a good message. And he said, and so he changed the way that he preached because he didn't want anyone to say, wow, Mr. Spurgeon, that was a great message. No, he wanted at the end of his sermon to say, wow, what a God, what a Savior. And so when we think about our life, at the end of our life, we shouldn't, we, we shouldn't want to hear, wow, you did really good. You shouldn't want man's applause. You should want God's applause. You should want to hear God. You, want, should be, want, you should want to be well Pleasing in the sight of God. The only way we live the Christian life well is through the Godhead. So think about this. God accepts us as sons and daughters. That's good news. We are no longer, the, Satan is no longer our father. God becomes our father. And then Jesus intercedes on our behalf. He is making intercession with the Father on our behalf. He's the one who has paid our debt. And then we think about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lost the place. The Holy Spirit indwells us. He comes and He indwells us. He lives inside of us. And He is what allows us to live the Christian life well. So the only way that we can live the Christian life well is by yielding to the Godhead. We allow God to accept us as sons and daughters. We allow Jesus to intercede on our behalf. And we allow the Holy Spirit to indwell us, to live inside of us. And then we see that there's a change in the way that we live. There's a change in the way that we live. The Bible says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Have you ever met someone who has to complain about everything? They have to complain about everything. I think about my pastor growing up. He used to sing this song called Excuses. And the whole gist of this song was as long as the devil could keep people complaining about the church, they wouldn't go to the church. So whether it was the preacher preached too loud or the preacher preached too soft, it was too cold in the building, it was too hot in the building, whatever they could do to keep, uh, to keep the people's eyes off of Jesus and keep them on their, their own problems, uh, the more they would stay away from church. And so Paul here is saying, do all things without murmurings and disputings. We ought to live that way. We shouldn't complain about every single thing that happens in our life. 1 Corinthians 10.10 10 says, neither mur murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Think about the children of Israel in the wilderness. 
Those guys were complainers, weren't they? They complained. Uh, they, they, they literally did nothing but murmur and complain about the wilderness. It took one day to get Israelite out of Egypt, but 40 years to get Egypt out of the Israelites. They asked Moses if he brought them to the wilderness to die. They're walking around and he said, what? We could have... What, they didn't have enough graves in Egypt for us? He brought us out here so he could kill us? And if that wasn't bad enough, then they complained about not the water. Well, the water doesn't taste good. Well, at least you have water. Then, then if that wasn't bad, then they complained about being hungry after God provided manna every single day for them. Manna, heaven bread. They had heaven bread provided for them every single day. They complained that it wasn't good enough anymore. And then we think all the spies but two complained about the land God had promised them. They sent 12 spies and 10 of them came back and said, no way are we going in there. The people there make us look like grasshoppers. The grapes are bigger than all of us put together. It's amazing. And then we see in Numbers chapter number 21 verses 5 and 6, it says, And the people spake against God and against Moses, Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, or, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. God got tired of the murmuring. God got tired of complaining, and He sent a serpent to the people. Acts chapter number 6 and verse number 1 says, And in those days, when the numbers, number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Paul didn't want the murmurings going on around this church to cause them to lose their testimony with the world around them. Think about that. Paul was someone who don't murmur and complain because it's going to ruin your testimony. When we, when we murmur and complain all the time, it's going to ruin our testimony eventually. Because no one likes to be around that. that that's not what people are looking for. Then we see why was the change necessary. Why was the change necessary? The Bible says um, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Why was the change necessary? Because they needed to be lights in a dark world. Amen. Matthew 5, 15 and 16 says, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We should be blameless, we should be harmless, and we should be without rebuke. That's what God has called us to do. We should be blameless, harmless, and without rebuke. And the reason for that is because of the wicked and perverse generation that we live in. We live in a wicked world. We live in a world full of darkness. And the only light that some of them will ever see is our light shining in, in the community. And so we need to make sure that our light is shining and shining bright. Deuteronomy 32 verse 5 says they have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They're perverse and crooked generation. We don't want God to say that about us. We don't want Christianity to die with us because we didn't let our light shine. No, we want to go forward for the cause of Christ. A.W. Tozer said this, Modern Christians hope to save the world by being like it, but it will never work. The church's power over the world springs out of its unlikeness to it. Never from its integration into it. The reason that we're different from the world, the reason that we are still church, church as it used to be, church as in the first century church, the reason that we still practice the things we practice is because if we ever want to reach the world, we cannot be the world. Amen. We cannot be the world. We can't, uh, we, we can't think just because we integrate ourselves into the world that we're going to win the world for Christ. Because more often than not, what happens is that the world wins. We think, oh, I, we, we think about relationships. We think, oh, if I, if I date this guy or if I date this girl, I'll win him to Christ. No, you won't. Oftentimes, you, you won't. And so we think about our, our lives as Christians. We ought to be different. We ought to be the light of the world. Verse number 16 will be done. It says, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. That's the rapture. That I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. The reason for all of this is so when we are raptured out, we know that we didn't run this race in vain. And we didn't run it for emptiness. We didn't run it but just for fun. No, we ran it for the prize. And that's seeing Jesus Christ face to face. And neither did we labor in vain. We didn't work for nothing. 
We worked for Christ, and one day when we see Christ, we're going to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And so this morning, we've heard God's word preached. We've heard a challenge. We've heard uh, to, to be the light of the world. We, we've learned to work out our own salvation. So this morning, I want to challenge you. If maybe today you've never accepted Christ as your personal Savior, today's the day. We, we're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised one moment from now. Today is the day of salvation. And so if you've never trusted Christ, your Savior, come this morning. I can show you from the Bible. Someone else can show you from the Bible. We'd love to show you because at the end of the day, if we have the heart of Christ, we don't want to see anyone perish or go to hell. Or maybe you say, Brother Cody, I haven't been working out my own salvation very well. Come this morning. Ask God. God, show me how. Show me uh, what you want for me because at the end of the day, we can say all we want and we want to do it, but until we ask God to do something else, it's not going to happen. And maybe you say, Brother Cody, this morning I've never uh, joined Washington Street Baptist Church. Come this morning. Today's the day. God died for the church and therefore it's important to him. And so you ought to be a part of it. So at this time I'll ask him to stand. We'll have a verse of invitation. Let's pray and then we'll sing him 85. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this day. And thank you for allowing us to be in your house. God bless this invitation. Help there, if there's one here who doesn't know you as a personal savior, to not leave today without getting that settled. And you say and pray. Amen.